let's say i have a loan which carries a floating interest rate what do you mean by floating interest rate that means the interest rate changes periodically when the interest rate is changing periodically how will you come up and establish that this is exactly your interest rate or effective interest rate at which the loan should be measured it is very difficult because the loan rate keeps on changing every year that is the reason why floating interest rate becomes very interesting because your value of loan or the value of effective interest using uh, amortized cost using effective interest you don't know which rate to apply last year it was 11 and a half current year it has come down to 9.8 so automatically there is a change in interest rate there should be a change in amortized cost does this require me to change the value every year does it require me to change in the value every year absolutely no absolutely no so that is what he is trying to say that whenever you have taken a loan at floating interest rate your effective interest rate amortized cost calculation should be based on the interest rate applicable at the beginning of the transaction at the beginning of the transaction that means at the date on which the loan has been taken but what if the loan changes even if the loan change the amortized cost still will still be calculated based on the initial interest rate itself sir but interest cost will have to change yes the interest cost in your pnl will only be recognized to the extent of floating interest rate look at what i say whenever i take a loan using a floating interest rate my initial recognition should be at amortized cost using prevailing interest rate but my subsequent recognition if there is a change in the floating interest rate then the amortized cost should not be changed straight forward recognize the finance cost using prevailing market rate but your amortized cost calculation should still be following the same prevailing interest rate computation clear this is the concept regarding floating interest rates clear now let's come to the concept of a derivative what is a derivative first of all what do you understand by a derivative remember guys a derivatives are nothing but forward contracts they are futures options all these are derivative instruments now remember a hedging instrument is generally a derivative instrument i am not saying compulsory i am saying it is generally a derivative instrument which with which we normally hedge now what is the fundamental characteristics of a hedging instrument for you uh, sorry for what is the fundamental characteristics of a derivative for me to call something as a derivative there are three fundamental characteristics that it should hold number 1 it should have a future settlement date number 2 it changes in value because of a change in the underlying asset it changes in value because of a change in the underlying asset a derivative like a forward contract to to sell dollars a forward contract to sell dollars changes in its value because of the change in exchange rate an interest rate swap changes in value because of the change in interest rate so any forward contract or any interest rate swaps that you enter into they always change in value because of the underlying asset let's say i enter into a forward contract which is in a commodity index in the commodity index let's say a particular commodity like nickel has been traded a commodity of nickel which is a metal if i am entering into a forward contract that forward contract changes in its value or the derivative changes in its value because of the change in the value of the metal nickel clear so i said any derivative should always change in its value because of the change in the underlying asset and it should always be settled on a future date another most important characteristic of a derivative is that the initial transaction cost uh, to enter into a transaction is very minimal or sometimes even zero it is very minimal or sometimes even zero to enter into such kind of transaction clear so these are generally the concept of derivative remember guys whenever i say derivative these derivatives should always be treated as fair value through pnl you have no other classification for a derivative they should always be treated as ftpl be it a financial asset or be it a financial liability it should always be ftpl if the instrument is of a nature of derivative instrument clear now 
let's get into this it changes in its value with respect to a change in the underlying asset there is a very low or minimum initial investment or sometimes no initial investment and it is always settled at a future date such a derivative is always held for trading purpose therefore it should always be trade uh, designated as FETPL unless it is a hedging instrument if it is a hedging instrument we have seen hedge, inst hedge accounting but if it is not a hedge instrument then it should always be treated as fair value through PNL. clear now why did you explain me this concept of derivative instrument I will tell you I explained you this concept of derivative instrument to help you understand with another concept called as hybrid instruments why is b capital even i don't know hybrid instruments i'll write it like this what is a hybrid instrument and what does it have to do with a derivative a hybrid instrument is a host contract which has an underlying derivative the host contract the host contract is generally non derivative there is a non derivative host contract which has a derivative instrument which is embedded into it this derivative instrument which is embedded into it is generally called as embedded derivative it is a derivative instrument which is embedded into a host contract which is a non derivative instrument Sir, what are you talking? Nothing I understood. Example. A contract to sell inventory to a customer in US in dollars guys here the host contract is a contract to sell this contract to say a contract of sale is generally a non derivative instrument a contract of sale is generally a host contract which is non derivative but that sale contract is denominating values are my currency in dollars so therefore that there is a change in the value because of the change in the value of a dollar therefore the dollar exchange rate should be considered as exchange rate or ER is considered as derivative I'll take one more example issue of bonds by an enterprise in let's say pounds so there are two things here one is a bond bonds are basically long-term loans they are loans which are purely non-derivative in nature it is a host contract which is non-derivative but because this bond is denominated in dollars this dollar uh, is denominated in a foreign currency that is a pound here the pound exchange rate becomes a derivative instrument therefore whenever you have such kind of situations you come across a case where the host contract is not der non-derivative but it is increasing or decreasing in value because it has an underlying embedded derivative it has an underlying derivative instrument 
which changes the value of the host contract. Whenever I come across these kind of concepts where there is a hybrid contract where I have a host contract and also a derivative which is attached to the uh, original contract. In such cases, I'll have to understand what is the accounting approach. My accounting approach for hybrid contracts is given like this. Whenever I have a hybrid contract, always try to identify your hybrid contracts in two ways. I'll use both the examples which I have given. Where the host contract is also covered under India's 109. Under India's 109. That means it is also a financial instrument or Sometimes where the host contract is not covered under India's 109. Guys, go back to your earlier examples. The two examples which I gave you, first case where it is a non-derivative non host contract, a non-derivative contract to sell, this non-derivative contract of sale should be as per India's 105, oh sorry, 115, which is contracts with customer. But whenever you talk about bond, bond should be covered under India's 109 because bonds are nothing but financial instruments. There is an obligation of the enterprise to pay and whenever there's an obligation to pay cash, it has to be called as a financial liability. So therefore bonds are covered under India's 109 while your contracts to sell are contract with customers. So revenue from contracts with customers is decreating that. So that should be as per India's 115. Therefore both the examples fall under each category. Post contract covered under India's 109 which is nothing but the bonds which were issued in pounds. Post contract not covered under India's 109 is your contract for sale denominated in dollars. Whenever I have the situation where the host contract is covered as per India's 109, in such cases, classify the entire contract as FETPL. That means a change in fair value should always be transferred to PNL. Whenever I have a hybrid contract where the host contract has an embedded derivative, but the host contract is also a non-derivative contract, which is covered as per India's 109, I will classify the entire hybrid contract as FETPL. But if the host contract is not covered under India's 109, like I gave you the example of contract of sale in such cases, I'll further divide it into two parts where the first part I'll talk about where the derivative can be separated from host contract or sometimes where a derivative cannot be separated from host contract. If a derivative cannot be, ca sorry, can be separated under the first instance, in such case, host contract should be accounted as per their respective standard. Here in the case of contracts with customer, I'll have to dictate the, or I'll have to decide the host contract as per India's 115. While the derivative which is embedded into the host contract should be as per FETPL. Should always be measured at fair value through PNL. But if 
the derivative cannot be separated from the host contract then in such instances entire contract is FETPL you cannot separate it no separate treatment I will enter the entire contract as FETPL so in the second case where I issue the bonds in pounds it is a non-derivative host contract of a bond where there is an embedded derivative of a pound but since bonds are also covered under India's 109, pound is a derivative instrument. Therefore, both combined should always be treated as FETPL. But if I go as per the first concept, where I talk about a contract to sell inventory to a customer in US in dollar, then it is a non-derivative host contract where the exchange rate is a derivative instrument. So therefore, the contract to sell should be as per India's 115 and your dollar, which is a derivative, should be classified as FETPL. Let's take a particular example here. Example. On 15th of Jan, I entered into a contract with X to sell goods for thousand dollars on 15th April contract to sell is a non-derivative host contract covered under India's 115 but denominated in dollars therefore there is an embedded derivative of exchange rate in dollars which should be covered as per India's one one uh, it should be covered as per India's 109 here in such instances I'll come with the logic now you see first I'll have to make sure that since it is not covered I'll have to separate the host contract and I'll have to separate the derivative I will separate host contract and derivative when is the sale expected to occur on 15th of April that is exactly three months from the date of transaction on the date of transaction let's say a three month forward rate of dollar is let's say rupees 70 or 72 per dollar therefore the contract for sell should be separated so how will i separate or in this instance the contract of sale is equal to measure it what is the value thousand dollars what when is it expected to occur 15th april after three months three months forward rate is 72 therefore the value should be 72000 let's say in this case on 31st of march fifteen days forward rate 15 day forward rate of dollar is 73 per dollar guys the value of the derivative has increased the dollar rate which was initially 72 today has become 73 that means i am expected to receive excess value of another thousand rupees in such case i'll record an entry like this Derivative asset account debit gain on change in the value of the asset 
since it is FTPL, I'll have to transfer it to PNL. I'll record thousand rupees. Let's say on the date of transaction that is on 15th of April, the dollar spot rate has become 71 per dollar. It has become 71 per dollar. Then how do you record it? Then I'll have to record it like this. First, I'll have to basically record the derivative loss because the derivative instrument should always be measured at FTPL. As on the balance sheet date, I measured the derivative of dollar at 73 rupees. But now it is 71 rupees. Therefore, there is a loss in value of 2 rupees per dollar. So, p and account debit. to derivative asset which I already recognized is gone. There is no derivative asset. Instead, there is a derivative liability. Why is there a derivative liability? Because your loss is 2 rupees, not 1 rupee. So my loss is 2000, which I debited to PNL. I'll credit derivative asset to the extent I debited earlier on 31st of March and the balance I will transfer it to derivative liability. On this date, the transaction has occurred. So let's record the transaction sale to customer. Sale to customer. It is a non-derivative instrument. That means the sale should always be measured at the same rate which I decided earlier. I decided earlier that my contract of sale should be measured at 72,000. So I'll have to record the entry like this. Bank account debit. To sales. My sales is a non-derivative instrument. Fixed value. This is 72,000. But how much did I receive in dollars? I received thousand dollars at 71 rupees. Thousand dollars into seventy-one. I only collected through bank seventy-one thousand. What about the balance thousand rupees? This balance thousand, I parked it into my derivative liability. In the previous transaction, I recognized a derivative liability. That derivative liability of thousand will be recognized. So the derivative liability which was credited in the earlier entry is now debited so that the derivative liability gets closed. So this way the value of sale that is 72,000 has never changed. These are non-derivative host contracts and they should be separated from the derivative instrument. So for separation I use the three months forward rate and I made sure that the host contract is separated from the derivative contract. This is what we have learned here. Whenever the host contract is not covered as per index 109 and the derivative can be separated, then the host contract should be recognized as per the respective standard, while the derivative should always be treated as FTPL. And this is the example that I have given. Now let's look at the presentation that we look at. A hybrid instrument is a host contract which together exists with an embedded derivative. And these host contracts are generally non-derivative instrument. If the host contract is also covered under India's 109, then the entire contract should be classified as FTPL. But if the host contract is not covered under India's 109, then the derivative instrument should be separated from the host contract, where the host contract should, should be dealt as per the respective standard, while the derivative should always be classified as FTPL. If the host contract is not covered under India's 109, but the derivative also cannot be separated in absence of sufficient information, the entire contract by itself will be classified as FETPL. This is the concept of derivatives and hybrid contracts where we use the logic of embedded derivatives and where we try to separate from the host contract.
guys we generally come across one small last aspect which is related to corporate debt restructuring what do you mean by this corporate debt restructuring corporate debt restructuring appears because sometimes probably because of situation that we have just come up with like covid a company may not be in a position to service their debt the operations were so significantly affected that they are not in a position to service the debt so i go to the banker i sit down with the banker and i explain him that today the situation of the company is not in such a way that your debt can be serviced that means your emi can be paid as per periodical uh, time limits it is not possible there is a outstanding so much of interest which i have to pay along with the existing principal it is not possible for me to basically pay the loan in this particular structure so what you do is i propose that i am changing my operations I am trying to refine my operations in such a way that tomorrow I can make sufficient profits. I expect you to do is waive off the existing interest. Whatever outstanding interest is there, you waive it off. And even in the existing loan or let's say 50% you waive. The balance interest you add it to the term loan. And give me one year of moratorium period for which you will not collect any interest during that one year period. So this further negotiations which I do to the with the bank during the period of a loan where the loan has already been taken is called as a corporate debt restructuring. Very common phenomena guys. Today you come across situations where uh, you know Kingfisher is also gone into a bad debts or basically a non-performing assets. So these kind of loans they normally should be given an opportunity to restructure them. They should be given a fair opportunity to restructure. Uh, restructure i am not representing kingfisher by any chance but i'm just saying these are genuine business losses kingfisher airlines was not doing good that is the reason why they have incurred a loss so it is a right of the person to basically get a restructured debt so this restructuring is basically called as corporate debt restructuring what happens in the case of a corporate debt restructuring whenever i have a corporate debt restructuring I will have to first measure what is the amortized cost of the existing liability. The existing liability, if I measure it at effective interest rate, I will call it as part A. I will discount the restructured cash flows after the corporate debt restructuring process using the effective interest rate and I will call this as part B. The existing loans and the restructured loan, if I see a difference between both, and if such amount of, there is a difference. If there is no difference, there is no CDR. There is a CDR, definitely there is a difference. So if there is a difference between the effective interest rate amortized cost of the original borrowing and the amortized cost of the restructured borrowing using effective interest rate, then the a difference between both the amortized cost, if it is at least in excess of 10% of the remaining cash flows or your part A, if it is at least 10% of part A, or more than 10% of part A, then I will treat it as a new liability itself. The existing liability I will derecognize. I will give rise to a new liability if the difference is more than 10%. But if the difference between both the restructured cash flows using amortized cost at effective interest rate is within 10%, that means less than or equal to 10%, then the existing liability will not be changed. It will only be modified. It will only be modified. The difference between both these loans should be charged off to a PNL or can be amortized. Can be amortized over the remaining period. Clear? So either you treat it as extinguishment of earlier loan and treat it as a new loan which is emerged or you treat it as a modification to the existing liability. It depends upon what is the amount of difference between A and B. That is that A is your existing loan discounted at effective interest rate or the restructured loan which is used which is discounted at effective interest rate both the amortized cost you compare if the difference is at least or greater than 10 percent of part a then you treat it as a fresh liability if it is less than or equal to 10 percent then it should be only treated as a modification to the existing liability and that will bring us to the end of discussion regarding this concept of india's 32 
107 and 109. I did not touch 107 particularly because 107 was only a disclosure standard. So we have done a so we have done a detailed discussion of both India's 32 and 109, which particularly deals with financial instruments, which include financial assets and financial liabilities.